The class Hydrozoa is another interesting group of cnidarians. And these guys, like many other cnidarians, cycle between polyp and mediciform. On this page, we see uh, just the polyp forms of some, of some hydrozoans, and I'm going to show you some mediciforms on the next slide. Um, Unlike the Cyphozoans, though, the medusa phase does not really dominate. In fact, um, you're more likely to see polyp phase of hydrozoans, although the medusa phase can be fairly prominent for some species, too. So they, they have more like equal dominance. So Cyphozoans tend to be very dominant in the medusa form. Anthozoans tend to be dominant and actually only have a polyp form. And hydrozoans are a little bit more balanced with, I would say, a little more weight given towards the, the polyp side. The medusae of the hydrozoans are structurally different from the cyphozoans, so they don't have that really thick mesoglial layer, or quite as thick. Certainly it's thicker than their polyps, um, but they tend to be small, fragile, more delicate medusae. And um, they have a few structures that Cyphozo and Medusae don't have. In particular, what you see with the Hydra Medusae is that they have two main structures here that are obvious. They have something called a vellum, which is basically this sort of shelf of tissue around the bottom of the bell. You can see it over here as well. And what the vellum does is it allows the organism to sort of... Um, kind of squeeze together with its musculature and force water through a narrower opening. So they kind of kind of gives them this like jet propulsion activity. Okay, so they can move around and dart around more quickly. Uh, the other thing that they have is this structure called a manubrium, which is this sort of um, extension of tissue, this sort of tubular structure that extends down from the mouth. Okay, so the Cyphozoan medusae we saw before, they have no vellum, right, and they have no manubrium. So to summarize here, the Hydrozoan medusae are smaller and more delicate. They have a vellum and they have a manubrium. The Cyphozoans are bigger, thicker, um, and they have no vellum and no manubrium. One of the most well-known uh, hydrozoans is in the genus Hydra, and you guys are going to look at these in lab if you haven't already, some live Hydra. And one of the reasons they're easy to look at in lab is that they have some characteristics that actually make them atypical as hydrozoans, but it also makes them pretty easy to rear in the laboratory and um, be able to uh, take a closer look at them because they're small and easy to get a hold of. The three main differences between hydra and typical hydrozoans is, first of all, uh, one of the things that's unusual about them is that they're freshwater and not marine. So 99.9% .9 of all uh, cnidarians, including the hydrozoans, are marine. And so hydra is very atypical in that you can find it in freshwater. Again, another reason that makes it a little bit easier to rear. Another thing that's very atypical about Hydra is that they don't have a medusa phase, okay? Again, almost all other hydrozoans go through a medusa phase, and these guys don't cycle. So they do produce gametes um, from the gastrodermis, and you'll see in lab some of them are actually producing uh, sperm or eggs. A third thing that makes them atypical is that they're solitary, right? They're not colonial, all right? So being solitary is again very unusual for hydrozoans or hydroids. Again, typically hydro, hydrozoans uh, occur colonially. And this shows um, some examples of some different ways that they grow. But basically what you can see here is that a polyp will butt off another polyp and another polyp and another polyp. And in this example, what you're seeing is that the older growth is in this black here. All right, and that new polyps that have butted off are in white, just kind of relative time-wise. So this one's growing a little bit more laterally along what's kind of called a stolen. That term kind of comes from the plant literature. Okay, and so th the way that they grow isn't really that important, but the fact that they're just uh, butting off new polyps and the colony's getting bigger and bigger um, is, is one of the main points here. 
The other point that I really want to make is that because they grow colonially and stay attached, they have a shared gastrovascular cavity. Okay, so if they share the GV cavity, that means if some of these polyps over here are, say, these guys over here are feeding on this plankton. I'm making some little blue dots over here. Okay, so if these guys feed, they'll take in the food, digest it, but they can distribute the products of digestion to all other uh, polyps within the colony. Okay, so not every polyp has to do the feeding, and that, that can be an advantage to living in a colony. Many times the polyps within a hydrozoan colony are referred to as zoids. So remember that the whole hydrozoan colony uh, comes from a single larvae, right? So these are all genetically identical individuals here. And the, um, the single planula larvae is going to grow into a polyp, and then that's going to grow into all these additional polyps. So it gives rise to the whole colony. These interconnected polyps with their shared gastrovascular cavity um, tend to have a lot of other structures, and, and you can really go crazy with some of the terminology here. I want to just point out a few terms. Um, there's something called the parasarc, which is a sort of um, protonaceous type translucent covering. It almost looks like plastic. And in the lab, you're going to see um, a prepared slide of obelia that has a perisarch surrounding the polyps. Um, we're also, also going to talk in a little bit about the fact that there can be different kinds of polyps, that they're not all exactly the same, as you can see here. All right. Uh, this, the, these terms here, thecate and athecate, refer to the fact that um, if the parasarc comes up and surrounds the uh, tentacles, then they're referred as thecate. If there's no parasarc surrounding the feeding tentacles here, then it's athecate. Right. Obelia is a great example of a colonial hydrozoan, um, and it exhibits this um, difference in polyp form that I mentioned earlier. And the, the fact that they have differences in their polyp types is something referred to as a polymorphism. Okay, so they have polymorphic colonies. And again, the word polymorphic or polymorphism is used more generally to just talk about differences with, of individuals within groups. Okay, so that may or may not be physiologically connected groups. But in this example where we're talking about hydrozoans, I'm talking about the physical or physiological differences, or anatomical differences rather, in the different polyp types within the colony. Okay, so Abelia has both um, feeding polyps, okay, and those are obvious because of the fact that they have tentacles and they can capture food and bring it in for digestion. And they also have reproductive polyps, okay, and here you can see their little, um, these reproductive polyps here and here, all right, and they have these tiny little medusae in them. And what's going to happen is that they're going to butt off these medusae as part of the life cycle. And I'll go through the life cycle in a minute here. Okay, now um, feeding polyps, of course, have another name. They're referred to as the gastrozoids. Okay. So feeding polyps are gastrozoids, and the reproductive polyps are called gonozoids. Okay, so Obelia here just has these two types, gastrozoids and gonozoids. And as we're going to see, other colonial hydrozoans have other kinds of polyps as well. The ephra that's pictured over here is one of these tiny little medusa buds that has come off and is an early stage before it eventually matures into the adult hydromedusae. The last thing that I want to say about this picture on the left here is that these colors are not natural. This, this is a stained colony, so the red and the greenish blue that you see are artificial stains. And, and the same for the ephra over here. These, they're, they're usually translucent. Okay, they don't have these colors. These are, these are stains for the slides.
Here you can see a photograph of some living Obelia. So it's not dead and it's not stained. It looks a little bit more natural over here. And in this cartoon, you can see the, again, the genetically identical zoids as part of the Obelia colony. Some of the feeding polyps or gastrozoids, some of the reproductive polyps or gonozoids. So what happens is the, the little Medusa buds come off um, they are in the Ephra stage, and then again, they grow, off, they grow up into the adult Medusa. Okay, so they're going to be male or female, right? These guys are dioecious, as I mentioned, um, I think, at, uh, at another point in class. So dioecious means that they have separate sexes. So we'll see that we have an adult female that will, um, again, shed eggs into the water externally. And there's another male Medusa over here somewhere, an adult, right? Uh, shedding sperm into the water. The sperm find their way to the egg. There's fertilization. The zygote then forms into a planula larvae, a ciliated larval form. The planula larvae will then settle to the substrate and then develop um, by continuing to grow and bud off new polyps, okay, until it eventually forms the whole colony of polyps. And again, the cycle will continue with the reproductive organozoids budding off new medusas, which again turn into the ephra, etc. We don't see the strobilization like we saw in the cyphozoan life cycle. So that's one uh, main difference there as well. And again, the colony is a group of genetically identical polyps that formed from this singular planula larvae. And in spite of the fact that they're polymorphic, they're still genetically identical polyps, okay? So there's just certain genes that are going to be turned on in some of the polyps and um, not in other polyps. So they're genetically identical, but they don't express the same way. And that's part of what polymorphism is all about. Many colonial hydroids have um, different kinds of polymorphisms. And so um, we see the same basic types of gastrozoids and gonozoids, okay? These being the feeding polyps and these being the reproductive polyps. Um, and in addition, in this particular colony here, you, not only do we see that the form that the gastrozoids and gonozoids might take look physically different, but they have a third type of polyp here called the dactylozoids, and dactylozoids are used for defense, okay? So they tend to be very heavily studded with stinging cells that have powerful nematocysts, okay? So you, you have stinging cells with the nematocysts on the feeding polyps or the gastrozoids, but the really nasty ones and the more high concentration of nematocysts are found in the defense polyps or dactylozoids in, in many species. Vesalia, the Portuguese man of war, exhibits some really interesting polymorphism where they have gastrozoids, gonozoids, and also dactylozoids that are modified as a single tentacle. And these guys are just loaded with nidocytes and nematocysts, so they can be really dangerous. And these guys capture fish and sometimes really large fish. And because Visalia can get really huge, um, maybe even be deadly to a person. Um, the other thing is that one of the individuals is modified as this gaseous float. So it's a really interesting example of uh, this polymorphism in a hydroid. In these Google images here, you can see this uh, organism in all of its glory, where you see the float floats above the water and the tentacles extend bent down below. This last slide just shows the Physalia zoids here, the gastrozoid, the dactylozoid, and the um, gonozoid. And again, they have some really interesting morphology, and not, not all zoids are created equal for different hydrozoan colonies. Here you see that single tentacle of the dactylozoid, and also just a single tentacle of the gastrozoids, which is pretty interesting as well.